Man, I love Splatoon. I legitimately think this is one of the best online shooters on the market right now. You got the super fun competitive multiplayer that's really fast-paced and awesome. You have the really fun co-op board mode in Salmon Run that's really hectic. Uh, you got great style, great visuals, great music, great effort. It's great. It's great. It's great. But you know what else is great in Splatoon? The single player. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this video. I'm going to be going over every single single player mode in all the Splatoon games. And uh, for me, at least, this is something that actually puts Splatoon above a lot of other online shooters, even ones that I do really like. I'm very rarely into single player modes in competitive shooters. Because normally I find the multiplayer is just so much more fun than the single player stuff that I never really bother with it. There are a couple of exceptions to that, but generally if I'm playing an online multiplayer shooter, I'm playing it for the online multiplayer. But Splatoon is a bit different, probably in big part thanks to the fact that this is Nintendo, and they go about designing the single player of Splatoon a bit differently than a lot of other online shooters do when they make their single player modes. Because while the core of Splatoon is a competitive shooter, the single player modes are more designed like shooter slash 3D platformer hybrids. And obviously Nintendo has much expertise with 3D platformers, and that definitely comes through when you play the single player modes of Splatoon. But enough beating around the goddamn bush, let's get into talking about the game. So Splatoon 1 single player, I think is pretty alright. It's not great in my opinion, but it's still a fun time. The core design structure here is very, very straightforward. You got a linear level, you're at the beginning, get to the end. That's the game. And that is more than A-OK -okay by me. As long as you got good gameplay, fun mechanics, good level design, that kind of simple structure can work wonders. And I would say the first Splatoon does a pretty good job of making it work, but it is a bit slight, I would say. I'll say right now, I'm not really going to get too much into, like, mechanic breakdowns of Splatoon, because I figure most people know how this works well enough. You're a squid, you shoot ink, you can swim in the ink of your own color. That's pretty much all you need to know. And uh, I think the mechanics of Splatoon are really good. As far as multiplayer shooters go, it's very unique and I think very smartly designed. All the little nuances to how it works. It's a really, really clever idea and uh, that all translates into the single player very well. You still got really good mechanics here. And the levels do utilize them in lots of fun ways. Like one of the core ideas is spraying your ink all over to turn things into your colors. So you have lots of use of like invisible blocks and platforms and stuff that you can't see. So you have to spray around to make them visible and things like that. There are walls you need to climb to the top of. So you got to paint them your color. But then there'll be like enemy things that either clean off your ink or paint it with their own colored ink. So you have like a limited timing window or things you need to avoid. When you're in your ink, then uh, the enemies can't really see you if you're not moving too fast. So you can use that for like stealth to sneak up on the enemies but then they can also do it to you where there'll be just an area covered in the enemy's ink and then enemies just pop out of nowhere when you get too close lots of good use of the mechanics of splatoon here in the single player and uh, all the level design itself i would say is pretty good you get a balance of kind of more platformery sections where you have to get to the end via avoiding obstacles or doing some kind of thing and then kind of shooter sections where it'll just plop you into like a big arena type area and say kill all the enemies to get to the next thing. And it's constantly throwing you back and forth between those two different things, rearranging things in different ways, uh, making you adjust how you're approaching every encounter. And it's all pretty good fun. But I would say that it's never exemplary in its design. It's all perfectly good. But it's never particularly challenging or super interesting. Something I found uh, quite intriguing looking at uh, Splatoon's design is that it's actually quite similar to the 3D Mario games, particularly the Mario Galaxy games. There's a very similar design philosophy going on here. If you imagine all these different floating sections as little planets, then it's kind of the same general idea. You have a closed off segregated part of the level that is built around one specific kind of challenge that you need to do. And then once you complete that challenge, you get access to one of these things that launches you over to the next area where you will then take on the next challenge. And each level is kind of built around its main core theme or gimmick or idea. And as you go through the level, going from section to section, 
It expands on that idea that it establishes and does different things with it. And they're clever little ideas and they mix them up in uh, cool little ways. But at the end of the day, what you're actually doing from a moment-to-moment -moment gameplay perspective isn't really that incredible. It's good, but there's never a moment where I'm playing this going, Holy shit, this is so awesome, you know? It doesn't have those moments that get really, really intense. It doesn't have anything that makes you feel particularly cool. It is pleasant and fun and enjoyable, and that's about as far as it goes, which I think is very similar to a lot of 3D Marios, and especially the more linear ones, like the Galaxy games. The problem for me is that Splatoon operates on a kind of design that I've started to notice a lot of games have, especially Nintendo games, or especially uh, family games, kid-friendly games, things like that, which is not really that surprising. Because uh, you don't want to make games that are too crazy intense or difficult or anything if kids are going to be playing it. But a lot of games like this, they rely on what I'm going to call identify and do design. Where that's really all there is to the gameplay. You know, there will be some kind of unique, weird platform and then you have to interact with it in special, specific ways in order to get to the end of this platforming section. But all you actually do as the player, my job to complete this objective, is simply to look at what the game is asking me to do, identify what it wants me to do, and then do it. That is the game in Splatoon, and many other games like it, and that can be fine and that can be fun. But personally, I would prefer something where the process of doing it was also the game, where it was intense and challenging and forced me to juggle multiple things at once and was cool. And it's just not really in this game. It's fine. It's perfectly adequate. But for the entirety of my playthrough of Splatoon 1 single player, I felt like I was essentially on autopilot. I didn't need to think very hard to do anything in this game. It was all very obvious, very instinctual, and very easy. But again, of course, it's a kid's game. And when you think about it, prior to Splatoon, there weren't a lot of kids targeted shooters out there. So this could very well be someone's first grasp of playing a shooter like this. So I suppose this very simple and basic design makes a lot of sense. But uh, personally, not the most exciting thing in the world. Uh, but you know, it's still good, it's still fun, I still enjoyed my time with the Splatoon 1 single player, and I could see myself playing it again for fun. Which again, most other shooters, I don't even bother with the single player, so clearly that means to me that it is a significant step up over most of what's out there. Uh, other stuff for Splatoon 1 single player, uh, there are some levels here that are not built on bespokely designed, like, single player levels. Some of them reuse the multiplayer maps, which makes a lot of sense. It's a multiplayer shooter after all, so you want to utilize all the assets you created primarily for multiplayer and get some mileage out of them in the single player too. So you have these missions where you need to either get to the end and defeat all the Octolings, or, uh, sometimes you have, uh, a big flying saucer with like a mini boss at the top of it that you need to get to and then defeat. And these levels are pretty alright. They're kind of fun. They give you something that almost feels like playing Splatoon multiplayer, but in a single player context. Which kind of gives people like a taster of what uh, Splatoon multiplayer has going on. And it can be pretty fun. I would say uh, that it's a little overly repetitious though. Especially the ones where you go on the flying saucer. It's the exact same mini boss at the top of every single one of these. And it just feels a little bit cheap if there was some more variety in what you would do on these multiplayer modes in single player. I think that would have been uh, pretty cool. Uh, we also have boss fights in Splatoon, which I would say that generally the bosses fall under the exact same bracket as the core game. They're perfectly good, they're perfectly fine, but not really that interesting in their design to me. They're very simple, very straightforward very much figure out what you need to do and do it and not a whole lot more than that but like with the core game they're still pretty good and still pretty fun and i would say that they're better than most bosses you find in a lot of 3d platformers which makes sense because splatoon being primarily a shooter combat is something that's baked right into the game's core design unlike a lot of other 3d platformers where i don't really think fighting necessarily suits their design but Splatoon obviously does not have that problem. 
And I would actually say that the only part of Splatoon 1 single player that did kind of give me more of what I was looking for is the final boss. This is the one part of the game where things do get a bit chaotic and hectic and a little bit more challenging. And there are lots of different things going on that you need to juggle all at once. Avoiding the enemy attacks, killing the ads, shooting the enemy's attacks back at him. And they start throwing quite a bit of things at you all at once that you got to deal with and, you know, split your attention across multiple different things. And this is the one moment where it's like, this is, this is pretty intense, man. This isn't just like, what do I do and do it? This is, I am struggling to do what the game is asking me to do because it's hard. And, uh, it was fun. It's not the hardest thing in the world or anything, but it was the one moment of the game was like, yeah, yeah, more of this, please. This is good stuff. Fortunately, there are plenty of opportunities to get more stuff like that because there's a lot more Splatoon single player to talk about because now we move on to the single player mode of Splatoon 2, which is basically the exact same thing as the single player mode from Splatoon 1. It's actually kind of stunning playing these back to back. It is the same game right down to every single little detail of the design and the structure and how it's built. The pacing, even what little story there is, is basically the exact same kind of thing. You have a lot of reused animations and elements from the previous game being reused in Splatoon 2. It was uh, pretty funny playing these back to back for the first time. I had initially played each of the Splatoon single players when the games came out, so there was years of separation where I was like, yeah, this is very similar, but you know, it's new and it's cool and it's different. But now I'm like, oh my God, it is identical, which I guess is pretty fitting for Splatoon as a series in general, because really the whole series is one game that just gets added and improved every single iteration. These aren't really that different from each other as far as the overall core games are concerned. That being the case, pretty much all the strengths and weaknesses of the Splatoon 1 single player also apply here to Splatoon 2. But there's also some things from Splatoon 1 single player that I didn't mention because I figured I'd talk about them in this game because it's pretty much the same deal across both games. Uh, but first, Splatoon 2 also does have some new stuff going on that definitely do improve it over Splatoon 1. For one, this game is a bit longer than Splatoon 1 single player was. Splatoon 1 I was able to beat in one session, it only took me like two hours to do. Whereas this was about double that length, roughly, like four and a half, maybe five hours to do everything in the single player, which, you know, it's a bit meatier and that's nice. It also does get a little bit more challenging than the Splatoon 1 single player. Not by very much, but it is notably more difficult. It does feel like kind of a continuation of Splatoon 1 rather than a sequel. It doesn't feel like the difficulty like resets all the way to the beginning. We go back a little bit, but then we progress beyond what Splatoon 1 was doing. Again, not hugely, but a little bit, which I do appreciate. Uh, but probably the biggest addition that Splatoon 2 single player has over Splatoon 1 is the use of all the different weapon types. Because Splatoon 1 single player, it was all built around the just base blaster and that was all you used. I think in order to use the other weapon types, you had to use friggin' stupid amiibo friggin' crap. Uh, and there were only three weapon types in Splatoon 1 to begin with, whereas Splatoon 2 has, I think, like eight weapon types. And they're a lot more varied and they're just part of the single player where... Every level will have some kind of weapon assigned to it that it's primarily designed for, so it'll ask you, hey, use this weapon for this level, and then, you know, that gives a little bit of variety in terms of how you approach dealing with the different enemy types and stuff. So overall, Splatoon 2 single player is just a straight up upgrade from the single player in the first game, like the game overall, and that's all cool. But there are a couple things that have not been improved very dramatically, and some, I would argue, problems that haven't been fixed or addressed, or in some cases, kind of made slightly worse in this game. Two major problems I have with the single player of both of these Splatoon games, one of them is the upgrade system. As you would expect with a game like this, you can upgrade your character as you go using all the, like, fish eggs or whatever they are that you collect uh, as currency to buy upgrades and such, and that's all cool and stuff. But the prices of a lot of these upgrades are so ridiculously high that you're not really going to be able to get much of anything throughout the course of your playthrough. In both Splatoon 1 and 2, I only got maybe like a third of the upgrades because the game just does not give you nearly enough money to make any of this stuff attainable. 
Unless you want to replay the levels over and over and over, doing it with all the different weapon types available in Splatoon 2, there's just no way you're going to get most of this stuff. Which makes the system feel kind of superfluous. Like, why even bother having these upgrades if you barely let the player even utilize any of it? And Splatoon 2 adds on to this by having a whole, like, special collectible you can find in every level that you need in order to get these upgrades. So obviously that's something you want to go out of your way to look for and hunt these things down so you can get all those upgrades. But you still also need money for the upgrades. So by the end of my playthrough, I probably ended up only using like six of these things after collecting like 30 plus however many of them there are. And it kind of was pointless. So the economy balancing in both of these Splatoon games could certainly be a little bit better. But that brings me on to my other problem with Splatoon. I talked about those uh, collectibles that give you upgrades in Splatoon 2. The collectibles is my other issue with the single player of Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2. In recent times, I have developed this opinion that I don't know if collectibles in linear level-based games is a great idea. On paper, it seems like a good call because, you know, you can throw in some secrets here and there for the players to find. Then if you find it, ooh, look at what I found. That's a cool little bonus thing for players to hunt for. And obviously, collectibles are optional. You don't have to collect them. So if you're not feeling like doing the collectible hunting, then you can just ignore them and no problem. But that doesn't really work for me because there are benefits to getting these collectibles. You're motivated to try to search for them. Like I said, those ones give you weapon upgrades. And uh, the other collectibles in Splatoon 1 and 2 give you these little snippets of story, lore, world building stuff. And it's actually pretty fun and pretty cool and I like it. So I want to get these collectibles. So I do go out of my way to get them. And it feels like it can really harm the pacing of the game and the general moment-to-moment -moment way that I play, I feel is very negatively impacted by the omnipresent knowledge that I need to be looking for collectibles anytime I can. Collectibles in a game like this encourage this player behavior of not just playing the game, you know? When I'm uh, in a big combat encounter and there's all these enemies all over the place, I kill the enemies and then I can move on to the next section, but I don't. I stop and I check around every single corner and I make sure I didn't miss anything. Is there anything under this platform? Okay, there's nothing here. Now I move on to the next area and then I get to the next area. Oh, let me check around. Is there anything under here? What about on the back side of the platform I was just at? What about uh, around this corner? What around this box? Oh, there's nothing here. Okay, never mind. That was a waste of time. Well, what about... Uh, oh, no. No, nothing here. Well, what about at the end of the level? Is there something behind... Oh, no, there's not. You just end up wasting so much of your time on this tedious, pointless crap because there might be something somewhere. And I'm starting to ask myself, is the one out of 50 times when there is something somewhere and the reward of going, yeah, I found the thing, is that worth the 49 times where you feel like you're just wasting your time? When I'm playing these levels and I finally do get the collectible, or both collectibles in the case of Splatoon 2, making the problem a bit worse in my opinion, it feels like a weight has been lifted off my shoulders. I no longer have this responsibility pulling me away from just the fun of playing the game. I don't have to think about it anymore, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I can just go forward and engage with the video game instead of doing this scavenger hunt at the same time. And let's not forget about how bad these kinds of systems can be if you fail to find the collectible. If you get to the end of the level and you missed it, oh, well, I guess I'm gonna have to backtrack through the whole le- Oh, wait, you can't backtrack because of the way these games are designed with the segregated areas. So what you're gonna have to do now is replay the level you just played, but searching even more thoroughly than you were the last time. But now the fun of experiencing a new level and all of its unique challenges is gone. You've already seen all this stuff. So now it's even more tedious and even more slow paced than it was before. And what if you still can't find it and you go for a third and a fourth and a fifth run through the level? This happened to me in one of the levels of Splatoon 2. I just could not find this fucking collectible. And so it was like, all right, hit up the internet. Where is it? Look for it. And then it's just like, really? It's there? That's fucking annoying. And it's just not a fun experience to go through all of this when hunting for collectibles like this in a game. And as I said, sure, you don't have to do it, but it's something you can do in the game, and it's something the game encourages you to do. 
So I feel like it should be a fun thing to do, and I don't really think it is. And this is not a problem specific to Splatoon. But like I said, I think this is a problem across most linear games with collectibles, and I really don't like it. I much prefer having collectibles in more open-ended games, you know, sandboxes, collectathons, open worlds, things like that where exploring around and finding things, that is the core of the game. But in a linear challenge-based game like this, the fun in the gameplay comes from get to the end and plow through all the obstacles trying to slow you down. And searching around everywhere for all of the places the developers could have hidden something, I feel, gets in the way of that. That's my little diatribe on collectibles in linear games, and I do think it is a problem that both Splatoon 1 and 2 single player face. And I wanted to talk about that in so much detail because it is a problem that it seems to me like the developers of Splatoon also realized and they did eventually fix it in Octo Expansion. This was a DLC for Splatoon 2, a secondary single player mode, and this is where things change up a lot, and in very good ways in my opinion. The core design structure of Splatoon single player gets completely thrown out the window here, and we go for something very, very different. Now, instead of a series of linear levels that you have to get to the end of, Octo Expansion has a series of 80 missions for you to complete, and all of these missions do have their own levels, many of which are linear, get to the end the level style thing, but many missions are not. Many missions are some weird other objective or some different thing you need to do. And even the ones where it is about getting to the end, they're very irregular in their design. Very experimental, very weird, very bizarre, and in my opinion, way more interesting and challenging than either of the previous single player modes. Here is where Splatoon steps out of the shadow of the 3D Mario design philosophy and really starts doing its own thing, and it gets pretty freaking cool sometimes. The design of identify what to do and then do it is out the window. We got all kinds of weird ass shit in this game where they're really taking advantage of the various different elements and mechanics and systems of Splatoon and utilizing them in basically as many creative, weird, interesting ways as they possibly can. And admittedly, not all of these weird experimental forms of gameplay are that good. There are a number of missions in Splatoon 2 that can be quite annoying. For example, you have these missions here where you have to match these two stacks of boxes. You have the model and then you need to uh, match it to the other one. And this is kind of just annoying and not really very fun. That is the problem with this kind of weird experimental design. When you're experimenting, you're gonna fail sometimes, but at the same time when you experiment, you're gonna come up with some really weird, creative, interesting gameplay that is very cool. Some of my favorite examples would be missions where you need to get to the end of the level, but you have a limited amount of ink. Your ink will not refill, so if you run out, you die. So you gotta be very careful, not spend too much ink, don't kill enemies you don't have to, and uh, managing your stuff very adequately so you have just enough ink to climb that wall and no more than that. Fun little missions, but then you get really weird stuff where it's a simple mission, kill all the enemies, but the entire mission takes place on these boxes that break if they take too much damage. So, uh, whoopsies very easily to, uh, fall to your death on these, but at the same time you can utilize that to your advantage and break the boxes underneath enemies' feet to kill them as well. Cool, weird stuff like that. You also have these uh, missions where you have to knock around these magic eight balls and get them to the end of the level into a socket. And sometimes, admittedly, these missions can be a bit annoying, but they're also pretty clever and cool a lot of the times, where sometimes you have to separate from the ball and, like, set things up so that way a platform is under it so it can keep going on its path. You even have one of these missions where you're basically doing a pool kind of thing, where you're from a distance and you use a sniper rifle and you gotta knock them into all the different holes. Though, to be fair, there is one mission with these things where it's, like, ski ball tic-tac-toe, and it is so fucking annoying, but again, when you're experimenting, sometimes you get good things, sometimes you get bad things. And for every bad and annoying mission like that one in Octo Expansion, there's probably eight other ones that are more like this one, where it's just an arena, and you have a point that you need to defend, and they're just gonna send a ton of really aggressive octoling enemies at you, and you need to just hold the line for a minute and a half. 
and it's really fun and intense. You know, it's such a straightforward, simple design, but it's just so hectic and chaotic and fun. This is the exact kind of thing I was wanting to get out of the single players of Splatoon 1 and 2. There's no, what is the thing the game wants me to do and do it. There's an enemy over here and there, and there are two more enemies coming from the back, and oh god, how do I deal with all of them? And you just fight, and you just try to kill them and defend the point, and it's cool. And then when you get missions like that that are really intense and challenging and cool, at the same time, you can also take that same design and re-implement it into a design that's not as challenging or difficult, but is creative and fun and interesting in its own way. Like, okay, we gotta defend the point now, but it's on a separate platform for you in the distance, and you have this cannon, and there's all missiles being launched at it, coming from all these different directions, and so you have to make sure that you're shooting all the cannons as they approach the point to defend it. Oh god, there's so many of them coming from so many angles! Prioritize the closest ones are the ones that'll do the most damage. Oh god, there's way too many of them! Oh, just a couple more seconds! It's so goddamn fun. The amount of times that I failed a mission with 0.5 seconds left on the clock in Octo Expansion is pretty amazing. And even the missions where it's just get to the end of the level, those can be really weird and interesting and cool too. Like this mission here where to get to the end of the level, you have to ride these spinning platforms the entire time, but the platform only moves when you shoot the propeller. So you have to be shooting the propeller the entire time while also watching your footing and making sure you don't fall off of this irregularly shaped thing that's spinning while also hitting switches and killing enemies all at the same time. Your mind is constantly being pulled in three different directions in this game and you need to make sure that you don't mess up any of them. You also have things like time challenges where you know you have to break the targets before the time runs out and immediately I see that and go, Okay, whatever. So the timer is probably not really much of a factor, and I'm just gonna be able to breeze through this. No, motherfucker! Not at all. So many of these timing-based missions, it's like, damn, you have just enough time to complete the mission if you do everything almost perfectly. And the strict requirements of things like this force you to be a lot more careful and intentional with all the little aspects of the game that didn't really matter that much before, now they do. Making sure that your ink consumption is at acceptable levels and you're not using too much, making sure that you're using your sub-weapons adequately and efficiently, and also just paying more attention to the battlefield and the enemies, because sometimes just the straight-up, straightforward combat encounters here can also be way more challenging than anything from the core games of 1 or 2. Stuff like this, where you have this incline that you need to climb to the top of, and there's so many enemies throwing so much shit at you, and it's like, holy shit, this is crazy, dude! It's fucking awesome! There's nothing like this in any of the previous Splatoon single players, and I love it for that. I assume this is all thanks to the fact that Octo Expansion is a DLC, and I think developers are more comfortable, like, alright, everyone had their easy, friendly, little, uh, cutesy single player. Now it's time for the real shit. And that's what I'm here for. I am here for the real shit. And really, I could just keep going on and on and on. It's just great. It's so much fun, man. I could gush about Octo Expansion and all of its cool missions forever. But I can't because I have to gush about other things about Octo Expansion because there's even more that makes this stuff great. Like I mentioned, there's no collectibles here, so you don't have to worry about any of that. You can just play the game, go, 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 plow through these missions, shoot all the things, go forward. You don't have anything slowing you down, which is really fun. But also, there's a great built-in difficulty option with this game, where a lot of missions, when you go into them, you can select what weapon set you want to use, which is cool. It utilizes a lot of the uh, stuff from multiplayer again where you have a weapon and a sub-weapon combo, and all the missions are specifically designed for the options that are presented to you. And usually they will be easiest on the left, hardest on the right. So right there you have the option, how difficult do you want to make this mission for yourself? If you want to play on hard mode, then take the rightmost loadout, and it will make things quite a bit more challenging for you. But if you want an easier time, pick the middle or the leftmost option. Some missions only have one option, it's really specifically designed for something. Some missions have two or three. And me being me, I pretty much always go for the rightmost option without even really caring what's happening or what the mission is or what they want me to do or what the equipment even is. I'm just like, yeah, give me the hardest thing. But sometimes there are missions that are just a pain in the ass or annoying or it's too hard with the rightmost. I'm like, okay, give me the medium one. And I actually love this difficulty variability. The fact that on a per mission basis, you can select how challenging of a time you want it to be. 
And I'm sure for players that aren't as into the difficulty, you could probably take the leftmost option most of the time, and you'll probably still have a really good time with all the weirdness to the design. So it's really flexible and every player can enjoy it, but also you get a different experience every time. It's not just like you take less damage and you do more. The way you play the missions changes radically depending on what you want to use. Like there's a mission where you're riding on some rails and you have to shoot all the targets. That's a lot harder if you have to do that with a sniper rifle compared to a splatter shot, you know? So the core gameplay of Octo Expansion, those 80 missions are absolutely fantastic. You know, some duds in there for sure, but probably like a 90, maybe 95% hit rate of really cool, weird, creative, interesting, challenging missions that are fun in so many different kinds of ways. But then there is also what happens when you're done with all the mission-based gameplay, when you get to the final stretch of Octo Expansion. But before we start talking about that, Let's briefly talk on story stuff with Splatoon single player, because I've not mentioned it up to this point, because Splatoon 1 and 2 don't really have very much going on. Both games, again, are the exact same thing. The Zapfish has been stolen, which is the power supply for the city. You gotta go get it back from the evil Octarian Menace. Go! Video game! And, uh, that's pretty much it. You gotta beat evil DJ Octavio and, uh, get the Zapfish back. And, you know, there's some fun, cute characters. Captain Cuttlefish is, uh, pretty fun. And Callie and Marie, I like them. I think that they're very charming characters. But there's really not much to anything going on in Splatoon 1 or 2, substance-wise. Some cute character interactions and some funny jokes is pretty much all you're gonna get out of it. The coolest thing in both of them is all those notes that you find hidden around in the levels. Because like I said, those give you little tidbits on the lore and the world of Splatoon. And you realize that uh, there's a lot of like interesting, cool little stuff going on here that seems like totally kind of weird for what the game looks like. It's such like a bright, colorful, kid-friendly game. But then there's also this kind of weird, serious undertone sometimes. It can also get a little bit like bizarre feeling and it's very cool. I really like it. Like, what's the world of Splatoon? It's basically the real world, but everyone's a fish person. But then you read the lore and you realize that actually this is the real world where humans were. But there was an apocalypse and they were all wiped out when the world was flooded and sea creatures mutated and took to land and uh, all this kind of weird stuff. And there's also good little like character backstory stuff in there. There's things about how Captain Cuttlefish back in his day participated in the Turf Wars, the battle between the Inklings and the Octarians, warring for territory. And back before those wars, there was peace between the two different peoples, but now there's conflict. And the Octarians are very weird-ass creatures that have this kind of vibe of being like aliens or something. They got like flying saucers and weird technology. It's all really neat stuff, and it's a great motivating factor to get the player to hunt for those collectibles, because when I first played through Splatoon, I legitimately wanted to see every single one of those pages to get all the juicy little lore bits. But then, Octo Expansion comes along and completely blows that stuff out of the water. Clearly, Octo Expansion is the developers learning what everybody loves about Splatoon and really honing in on that stuff. Because now they've gone for something totally different. We're not saving no fucking Zapfish here. There's this really weird, moody atmosphere going on where we're at this subway system. And there's this talking phone booth that's like you're part of an experiment. And you're going to go to the promised land. And you're an Octoling. You're not an Inkling here, which was an enemy type prior to this. So that's a little weird what's going on there. And uh, Octo Expansion doesn't have a hub world like the previous Splatoon single players, it just has this little subway car that you ride in, and there's all these weird deep sea creatures here that look strange, and what the fuck is even going on here? Like, you're going through these trials and these tests, and the subway car is your way of getting from one to the other, but are people just going on, like, their commutes to work and school on this subway? Like, what's their lives down here? What the fuck is even going on? You look out the windows and it's like, what the hell is happening out there? Where is this place? It's so strange and I fucking love it. There was a little bit of stuff like this in the previous Splatoons where you look around and you realize that you're underground and the sky you see in the background is a bunch of screens and the sun is like a big weird lamp in the sky and like cool little weird world details like that. And this is just all that stuff. You get into these fucking levels in Nocto Expansion, it's like, what the hell is even happening? There's just, like, weird-ass shit floating around in the background. 
And it really doesn't matter. It's not supposed to make sense. Is this literal? Is this just video game stuff? Who cares? It's all just cool, so they do it anyway, and I am perfectly okay with that. But it's not just the weirdness. Octo Expansion also has some greater emphasis on more traditional storytelling, and it's got way more meat to it than the previous games. Because this time around, for this single-player mode, you got Captain Cuttlefish again, but you also have now Pearl and Marina from Off the Hook, the group that was introduced in Splatoon 2. Which I really appreciate, because Callie and Marie from the first game, they're cool, but they got their time with the first game, but then they were also the focus of Splatoon 2 single-player, where it's like, oh, Callie's been turned evil, and you and Marie have to go save her, and, uh, you know, it's like, come on, give the other girls their chance. Well, here's their chance. And I guess to make up for it, they gave them the way better campaign and the way better story. And really, there's still not that much story going on here, but the little they give you is just so freaking good. Because, you know, there's a lot more cutscenes of, like, what the fuck is going on and giving you the rundown of, you gotta complete all the challenges and get the four things to complete the thing to get to the promised land, which is the surface. And similar to Splatoon 1, you get lots of fun character interactions. Pearl and Marine are very fun characters, I like them a lot. So there's lots of cool stuff in there. But then additionally, you also get access to this chat room that gets updated every couple of missions, where you can see Pearl and Marina and Captain Cuttlefish just talking about stuff, exploring uh, what's going on, what this area is, and also just chatting about each other. And you learn about the characters and their backstories, and there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Uh, Pearl and Marina are very charming characters, they got a really good relationship, good history, and the writing here is so insanely good. I think one of the biggest strengths that Splatoon has as a franchise is that it's very, like, modern and hip with the kids and stuff like that, but not in a way where it's like, Hey, fellow kids, it's like, legitimately, they understand the modern trends and the youth and what they're into, and they really lock in on that so well. What the characters type in the chat room feels so natural and real, like what real people put in real online chat rooms and shit, and it's like, really funny a lot of the time. Well, like I said, you also get lots of good character moments, some heartfelt stuff, you learn about Pearl and Marina. And, uh, it really does a lot to make these characters really, really likable and get you invested in them and get you caring about them. And, uh, this is where Marina explains that the song that the Squid Sisters sang at the end of Splatoon 1 caused a bunch of, uh, Octolings to, like, wake up from the manipulation of the evil Octarians. And, uh, so they've been trying to escape from Octarian society and, uh, flee to Inkling society, which is why... She's an Octoling, which Pearl didn't even know, and there's some stuff about, like, sorry, I didn't know what to tell you, and Pearl, she doesn't actually give a fuck. She's like, whatever, you're Marina, you're my friend, that's all I care about. Uh, so that's what your character is. You're an Octoling that's woken up, and you're trying to get out of, uh, the Octarian menace. But also, there's, like, some other weird stuff going on here. There's some corporation, because all the Octarians you're fighting are, like, green and blue, and they're, like, modified. What's going on there? And, uh, again, you have that talking phone booth that keeps talking about, Oh, you're one step closer to getting to the promised land, and all this stuff. And then it all comes to a head when you complete all the missions. Well, you don't have to complete all of them, but you should, because it's just fun. Uh, but finally, you complete the thing, and you get in, and it turns out it's a blender, and it's gonna destroy you, and then, oh shit, Agent 3 shows up, the playable character from Splatoon 1. There's actually a part earlier on where you do a character creator for that character, and you're like, what the fuck is going on here? And then, boom, they show up and save you, and that's pretty sick. And, uh, now it's time to really get out of this place, stop going along with whatever they were up to, because clearly that's not gonna help you get out of here, so now you start going through the facility, and this is where things change up a little bit, where now all the, like, crazy weirdness turns into, like, this tension of, oh god, what's going on, we gotta get out of this strange laboratory corporation thing. And they do a really good job with the pacing of this. In the first mission, you have no weapons, so you just have to sneak around. But then you build up your arsenal, and then you can start plowing through things. And some of these levels are really fucking hard. Again, they're, like, pulling you in three different directions. You gotta manage all these different things at once. And you're like, fuck, man, this is so challenging, actually. Goddamn. But then there's parts where you're going through more of, like, the company area. And there's, quote-unquote, laser grids that you have to avoid, which does a really good job of feeding into the whole aesthetic of what's going on here. You have this one part where you have to climb on all these floating blocks, but then you look at the blocks and you're like, those are the weird fucked up Octarians, and they're like, in these packages. What the fuck is this corporation even trying to do? 
And I also want to highlight that as you're going further and further through these final stretch levels, what starts off as very, like, moody and quiet, slowly more and more music starts to pick up. And it's actually Pearl and Marina's music, and uh, it gets, like, more fast-paced and more loud and exciting as you get closer and closer to finally breaking out of this corporation, which does a good job of building up the tension. But of course, once you get out, it's not going to be that simple. And this is where Splatoon 2 Octo Expansion goes from being excellent to fucking phenomenal, because the finale of Octo Expansion, I gotta tell ya, I certainly was not expecting this the first time I played it. Holy shit. First of all, you get to the end of all the facility levels, and the boss to cap it off is a brainwashed Agent 3, the player character from Splatoon 1. And this is so awesome because it's like a rival fight against another character that has all of your abilities and stuff, but it's even more awesome because it's the character you played as in the first game. And they utilize that really well, where Agent 3's battle theme is a remix of the Splatoon 1 theme song. It's so fucking awesome. It's like, goddamn, I wasn't expecting this game to have a fucking Virgil fight, but it does, and it's really cool. But that's just the start of it, motherfucker, because after that, we get to the end, we get to the surface where the telephone is all fucked up now, and it reveals that it's like an AI created by humans long before the extinction that's goal is to create, like, the perfect species, so it's trying to like, remogrify sea life into the ultimate organism, which is why I wanted to blend you up and, uh, use you to contribute to the bio-slime that would eventually create whatever it's trying to create. But it has determined that uh, all this sea life is worthless, so it's gonna wipe it all out and start over from the beginning. And then this giant fucking human statue comes up, and it starts charging this big-ass laser that's gonna destroy all of Inkopolis, and it's like, holy shit, this escalated quickly. And Pearl and Marina show up, and Marina's a hacker, so she starts, like, looking up what's going on and sees that it's, like, charging from solar energy, so we gotta block out the sun on the statue so it can't charge up anymore by covering it up with ink. And so we get this big, epic final finale mission where you have to blow up all these bombs that Marina throws on the statue, and there's this fucking awesome music playing that really accentuates the entire thing. And it's like, I cannot believe what's going on here. Like, the first two single players, they had the big epic finale where it was playing the song from Callie and Marie and Power of Friendship or whatever, and it was cool, but it wasn't, like, anything that crazy. But for some reason, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, Octo Expansion has turned into fucking Gurren Login or a Platinum game, or anything by Studio Trigger. We've gone to, like, crazy-ass cosmic climax, epic music play, and, like, really getting you into the mood. It feels like I'm fucking playing a Kirby game right now at the end, fighting some god or some shit. And it actually feels quite impactful, despite how little story has been up to this point. What has been there was just enough and was so effective at getting you invested in the scenario, what's going on, this corporation, all of its shady shit. Pearl and Marina, super likable characters, there's even some fun stuff with Captain Cuttlefish, and now everyone's working together, you're gonna stop this thing. Even the fact that what you're doing, you have a three minute timer to completely cover the thing with ink. That's the main gameplay of Splatoon, that's Turf War, that's what you're doing, and it presents it as that. It starts up with like a multiplayer match flyby and says you're playing Turf War, and there's been nothing like this at all throughout any of the previous Splatoon single players, and all of a sudden we're doing this crazy ass weird cool finale thing. And the music is getting you so hyped up for it, and then you complete the mission, and they're not even done with the crazy spectacle stuff, because then Pearl busts out a killer whale, and it's actually been previously established in some of the Splatoon 2 unlockables, that she has, like, a really loud voice that can, like, break glass and, like, shake the earth and things like that, so then they build on that? Like, this was set up before Octo Expansion was even a thing, and then she screams into the killer whale, and it shoots a giant laser, and the other thing shoots a giant laser, and they're shooting each other, and it's fucking- uh, blah! I cannot believe how fucking awesome this is, and this fucking, like, kids game about spraying goddamn colored paint around. It is so bizarre for me to say that one of the hypest, coolest, most epic finales that I've ever played in any video game comes from a goddamn Nintendo kids shooter, but that is absolutely true. I 
adore the finale of Octo Expansion. This is the kind of shit that I am all about. These kinds of insane turn the dial up to 29 out of 10 go so crazy over the top finales. And when they're this well done, there's nothing else like it, man. I legitimately got so many chills the first time I did the finale of Octo Expansion. And I got those exact same chills playing through it again for this video because I had forgotten how fucking great this DLC is and how incredible this finale is. And you know what? It's not even over yet. Octo Expansion is not done being awesome quite yet because once you beat the campaign, you unlock a secret bonus boss fight, another fight against Agent 3, where now it is way fucking harder. It is really challenging. And again, I was not expecting a Bayonetta Rodan style secret super hard extra boss fight, but Octo Expansion has it for some reason. And I don't know why, but it's fucking awesome. And I love it. And it's a super fun fight. And every single thing about this DLC is incredible. It by itself completely blows both of the previous Splatoon single players out of the water. And honestly, most single players that I've ever played in any shooter or most other 3D platformers for that matter, it fucking rules, man. And for me, it elevated Splatoon from a cool new Nintendo franchise that I quite like to one of my top Nintendo franchises, absolutely. I fucking adore Splatoon. I love Pearl and Marina's characters. Pearl especially. I think she's really fun, really charming with her uh, chaotic energy. She's great. This to me is like everything I'm looking for in a video game. Great, weird, challenging, cool gameplay that's unique and unlike anything else you're going to find anywhere else. Fun, likable characters, good story, might be a simple and small story, but a good story that's engaging and charming and has such a kick-ass final sequence that just gets you so hyped and so excited and you come out the other end a changed person where you're like, damn, I just experienced something, let me tell ya. And it's one of those things that's really gonna stick with you. These are the kinds of games that I love more than anything. And I really wasn't expecting Splatoon to ever be one of those games. But it is. And it made me very, very excited for Splatoon 3, which we are now finally gonna get to. And this is a little bit different for me compared to all the previous games. I had played all the previous Splatoon single players up to this point. But this is my first time playing Splatoon 3 single player, and it was really, really, really good. But I do not think it was as good as Octo Expansion, unfortunately. But at the same time, I kind of expected that because it's not easy to top something as great as that. And unfortunately, yeah, they did not manage to, though they did try. They put in a valiant effort, but in my opinion, it wasn't quite enough. Though I do gotta say, Splatoon 3 single player starts out really, really well. Thankfully, I had not been spoiled on it, so I really didn't know anything about what Splatoon 3 single player was. So loading it up, I was like, ooh, what are they gonna do after Octo Expansion? How are they gonna try to follow that up? And then you start playing it, and it's... oh... The Zapfish has been stolen again? Really? That's it? That's kind of fucking lame. And then you start playing it, and it's... Yeah, it's the same thing as Splatoon 1 and 2 single player, where it's just a bunch of linear levels, and you got a hub world, and then you do all the levels, and there's a boss at the end. And the level design structure is very much back to the kind of design that we saw in Splatoon 1 and 2's base single players. And I was like, oh, I thought that after Octo Expansion, they'd be doing another, like, cool, crazy, weird thing and expanding on that. But, uh, I guess no. I guess we're going back to the traditional formula. That's a bit disappointing. But, to my very pleasant surprise, it was a fake-out. That's not what Splatoon 3 single-player is. 
You do like five levels of that and it makes you think that that's what it's going to be. And then you have a fight with DJ Octavio right away and it's like, give us back the Zapfish. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And you fight him, what would have been the final boss in one or two. Now it's the first boss and then after the boss fight, everything collapses and we fall down into this big old hole. And now, what's this? Where the hell are we? I did not know anything about this. I wasn't expecting this. I saw, like, the initial trailers for Splatoon 3 single player, and I thought, okay, we're doing, like, a desert Mad Maxi type vibe going on. That's pretty cool. That's a cool, uh, new stylish direction for Splatoon to go in. But no, actually, it's a different weird stylish direction where it's, like, this snowy kind of... NASA Space Center kind of thing going on underground, and it's like, well, okay. I guess that's what we're doing, actually. That's a fun little surprise. And uh, here you run into Callie and Marie, and this is where the real Splatoon 3 starts, where you realize that, yes, this is, in fact, a continuation of what Octo Expansion was doing. Same design structure, same general type of gameplay, same kind of weirdo mission design, and that is all great stuff by me. But now, on top of what uh, Octo Expansion was doing, we kind of get the best parts of that and the best parts of Splatoon 1 and 2 single player combined together. Because we have all the weird missions of Octo Expansion, but then we also do get the hub areas of Splatoon 1 and 2, but they're now expanded upon. And uh, we use the currency that we get for completing missions, like you did in Octo Expansion, that is now used for opening up new areas, clearing out all this fur. Uh, yeah, fur also, that's a thing. That's uh, kind of the new gimmick with uh, Splatoon 3, the return of the mammalians, uh, which is a very ominous sounding title. And uh, yeah, you see fur on all the enemy types and they're, uh, they've been kidnapped, which is why Octavio at the beginning of the game is like, I didn't do anything bad. Where are all my minions? What's going on? So again, it's kind of a similar thing to Octo Expansion, where the enemy force has been, like, controlled or manipulated or modified in some way by this new secretive villain. Ooh, what's going on? And uh, that kind of stuff is very enticing and exciting after Octo Expansion. And uh, this hub world is much, much better than the ones from the first two games. Much bigger, much wider. Many more things to uh, look for and hunt for. Because uh, another thing that they've added is uh, both of the kinds of lore, story, world building stuff from both the normal Splatoon campaigns and Octo Expansion are here. So as you complete missions, then you'll get access to this log from the AI that runs this whole facility where you can learn about uh, more of that Splatoon history stuff and what's going on in the background and uh, what this facility is and what its whole deal is. But also, you get those uh, scrolls that are the collectibles, where you get the pages and the scrapbook. But, a nice thing they've done here that I think is a big improvement, these collectibles and hunting for them is done squarely in the hub worlds. Now that they're bigger and more open areas, uh, looking for things in them is a lot more fun. And it means we still get that focus gameplay in the missions where you don't have to worry about anything like that. So you get the best of both worlds, a fantastic design choice, big improvement. Another thing that's been vastly improved here is the upgrading system from Splatoon 1 and 2 that you barely got to use. Here, the economy is so much more well-balanced and you actually get to use the uh, skill tree now, which is also different. There's now a skill tree. And uh, by being thorough, doing every single mission, finding every single collectible, I was able to fill out the entire skill tree by the end of the game. So you actually get to use all this cool stuff, which is very nice. So, in many ways, Splatoon 3 single player seems like the ideal single player for Splatoon. It's the biggest of any of them, it's the longest, and it's got all the best bits from both Octo Expansion and the core campaigns of 1 and 2. Lots of great stuff here. However, unfortunately, in my opinion at least, it falls short in a couple of areas. Number one for me being that the challenge has been cranked down from Octo Expansion, which is understandable because Octo Expansion was surprisingly difficult, and I imagine a lot of people probably struggled with a lot of things in Octo Expansion. And, you know, this being the core main single player of this game, not an add-on or a DLC or anything, you want people to be able to beat it, you don't want it to be anything too crazy or whatever, 
So they toned it down, and it's not as challenging as it was in Octo Expansion. It's still harder than Splatoon 1 or 2 single players, but uh, definitely not up to the level of Octo Expansion. Fortunately, that's not the biggest problem in the world, because we still get really weird, cool, creative level design and mission design here, and a lot of it is in some ways even more creative and interesting than things that were in Octo Expansion, so that kind of makes up for it in a good way. But to be honest, I was a bit, I don't know, disappointed that this is basically just Octo Expansion again. I think one of the things that made Octo Expansion stand out for me so much was how fresh it was and different and unique and interesting. And doing the same thing again is the opposite of fresh and unique and new and interesting. It's just more of what we already got. But uh, I don't know, I felt like maybe I was hoping for another new, weird, creative, interesting type of single player rather than just iterating on the previous version of single player. So that was slightly disappointing to me, but still, overall, very good, very fun, fun challenges all over the place. Again, I could go on and on about all the cool, weird mission designs. There's this one where you have to go through a maze, and you're like, okay, well, you can go up the walls, so that's not really much of a maze, but then you get to the end of it, and then it flips and becomes a wall, and you gotta get back to the beginning. It's like, do you remember the layout now that it's vertical? And uh, it's a cool little design. You still have all kinds of clever, weird things you're doing throughout Splatoon 3, and it's still very fun. But like I said, it's not quite as magical as Octo Expansion was. I would say it's almost as good as a game to play. But uh, Octo Expansion wasn't just a fun game to play, it was also a great experience. And Splatoon 3 is also a very good experience. But it does not hit those same highs, not in my opinion. And uh, the story and spectacle stuff is the biggest disappointment for me in Splatoon 3 compared to Octo Expansion. Story-wise, what we have here is fine, it's good, but... It's not, it's not quite there. First of all, we have the new characters introduced, Shiver, Fry, and Big Man. And I'm not really in love with them. Deep Cut, their characters, and eh, they're presented as the bosses of this game. And they're fine. I'm not hugely in love with their, like, traditional Japanese theming. It's okay, but it doesn't really blow me away. And as characters, they have significantly less development than Callie or Marie across three games at this point, or Pearl and Marina, thanks to Octo Expansion. You don't get nearly as much out of these characters because they're antagonists for most of the story. You don't really get to spend a lot of time with them, you don't really get to know them, you don't get to see a lot of character interactions with them. I don't really care for these characters very much. The story just didn't give me enough to care about them. You know, at first they seem like they're a selfish group. They're out for themselves. They want money. They want the treasure of this place so they can sell it. But uh, at the end it's revealed that they want to get that treasure so they can sell it to help out the people of Splatsville. They're good guys. And then they team up with you and it's like, okay. That's pretty much all there is to the characters. There's nothing more than that, which is a little lame. And extra, unfortunately, I feel like the finale of Splatoon 3 does not live up to the finale of Octo Expansion. Because again, it being basically Octo Expansion 2, I went in kind of expecting to have a big epic crazy finale. I expected that after I completed all the missions and there'd be a final stretch of levels where I had to go through the rocket launch site in order to get to the top. And partway through the game, I was looking at the rocket and I was like... We're going to space, aren't we? There's a fucking rocket there. We are definitely going to space. That is what's happening here. Which I am A-OK -okay with, and I actually think that's fine that they tease it that way, because it's like, hell yeah, dude, going to space, that's fucking one of the check marks to make big, crazy, epic finales super cool. But it kind of set my expectations a little bit too high. I figured that they would really do their best to go as crazy and as huge and as insanely over the top as they could. And in my opinion, they didn't really go nearly as far as they could have, which was a bit disappointing. Cool revelation, though, it turns out the villain of this game is Mr. Grizz, the head of Grizzco, who players have been working for throughout Splatoon 2 and 3 doing Salmon Run. 
collecting him all of those eggs that he's been needing to power the rocket so he could enact his plan of giving the world back to mammals by transforming all of fish life into mammals. And then you see Mr. Grizz, and he's this weird-ass looking bear, and it's like, this is the kind of stuff that I definitely want to be seeing out of Splatoon single players. This is good. This is building up to the finale in a good way. I like this. I like where this is going. Let's fucking do it. And then, yup, we absolutely go to space, and there's a nice little power of friendship moment, though I feel like it's a little weak because you don't really have much of a connection to Deep Cut. These characters, you barely spend any time with them, so eh, it's not really hitting that hard. And then you go to space, and you're on the rocket, and it's like, all right, let's fucking do it, bro. And it's got this really weird, quirky music playing, and you're like, okay. This is not the tone I was expecting for Stop the Bad Guy from ruining the entire fucking planet. But okay, that's what we're doing. And then DJ Octavio shows up in his robot, and you're like, oh yeah, this is more like it. Come on, come on, we're getting there. And in my head, I was imagining a scenario where Mr. Grizz was meeting up with the rest of the mammals, and with the extinction event, a bunch of mammals went into space, and they've been waiting for their opportunity to return, and we'd have this giant fleet of mammalians, as this game story set up, the return of the mammalians, so I thought there'd be, like, an entire invading alien force of mammals coming back to attack the Earth, and we'd have to fend them all off, but actually, no. It's just Mr. Grizz on the rocket. Not nearly as cool as I was expecting. But still, there's some cool stuff in here. Uh, Small Fry, your little uh, salmonid buddy that's been uh, with you throughout the entire game. Everyone uses their power of friendship or something. I don't even really fucking know what's going on, but who cares? He turns into a giant salmonid monster boss thing, and then it's like, oh yeah, this is cool. Kaiju fights, let's go. And it starts playing the big epic music with all the characters singing, and it's like a remix of the Calamari Incantation with Deep Cut contributing to it, and that's cool. But the song is definitely not as good as the song from Octo Expansion, so it's not quite as hype. And again, I'm not nearly as invested in the characters in this. But then at the same time, the final gameplay sequence is you teaming up with Octavio and controlling his robot, and it's like, yes, team up with the previous bad guy, control a big robot, these are good finale things to be doing. But then the actual gameplay isn't particularly great, and it's not really as hype as it could be, because you're like on the sidelines of the fight while uh, your little buddy fights uh, Mr. Grizz. And to me, I'm like, this can't be it. This is There's another phase after this. We're not doing it just here. There's going to be something else. We're going to go even bigger. It has to. This is the finale of the Splatoon main series, right? going to be another layer beyond this. And sadly, there isn't. Once you vacuum up all the things, then just like the super weapon, which is nice that they keep it consistent, uh, you shoot it all back to him in a big uh, blast of ink, and that destroys him, and then the rocket blows up, and you save the day. And it's like, oh. Oh. It kind of left me hanging there. I was expecting more. I was expecting to go bigger. And to some people, it might sound like, you expected it to go bigger? What do you want? We're in space, we're in a robot, we're fighting a giant monster with a giant monster. But look, I've watched a lot of Trigger anime in my day. It can definitely go much, much bigger, trust me. So that was a bit disappointing. But to be fair, that was me hyping myself up with expectations that the game didn't necessarily set up. But Octo Expansion also did not set up that there'd be a big, crazy, huge finale anyway. So I figured after that, we gotta top that. We gotta do bigger. And I figured they would try to top it as much as possible. Go as big as possible. Rather than just going the next step up, you know? So, uh, yeah. I was a little bit let down by Splatoon 3 single player. But make no mistakes, it's still really good, really fun, really enjoyed it, and the ending is still big and epic and cool, and I did still very much enjoy it. It's just not as good as Octo Expansion, man. Octo Expansion? That's it right there. That's what it's all about. Which is why I was excited for Splatoon 3 Side Order, because if anything is gonna recapture the magic of Octo Expansion, it should be this. Octo Expansion was a DLC add-on for Splatoon 2, now we have the DLC add-on for Splatoon 3. We're bringing back Pearl and Marina as our major characters, and like Octo Expansion, it's not a rehash of anything that came before, it is once again its own unique new type of single-player mode for Splatoon, so okay. Let's see what this has to offer. 
And I'll definitely say, I think that Side Order is pretty damn good. It's very interesting in that it is a roguelike mode for Splatoon, which certainly had me interested. I'm not the hugest fan of roguelikes in the world, but I like them. I've played a couple of roguelikes that I very much enjoyed. So here's the dealio with side order. You're climbing a tower and there are 30 floors. You got to get to the top floor and beat the final boss. And every floor is going to be some kind of challenge that you need to complete. And one big difference that Side Order has compared to any of the other single player modes in Splatoon is that these are not levels. They're not designed with a beginning or an ending. They're not specifically designed for these missions like Octo Expansion in Splatoon 3. These are more like arenas. Their design philosophy is more like that of multiplayer maps that are conducive to many different types of gameplay depending on the mode. You can approach them in many different ways. It's very open-ended. And that is because this stuff is reused. This being a roguelike mode, of course, you're meant to be playing it over and over and over again, so to crank out as much variety and content out of it as possible, they have different mission objectives that kind of function like different multiplayer modes just in a single-player context. So you'll be on this map on this difficulty with this game mode, but then you might be on the exact same map in a different mission with a different objective on a different difficulty. And each floor basically functions as a micro multiplayer match, but within a single player context, which is very unique and interesting. And I think it works pretty well here. There are a handful of different modes, many of which the objectives are kind of like a single player equivalent to a multiplayer mode. So example, there's basically single player splat zones where you have a zone that you need to control by having it in your color of ink and the enemies are going to salt that and try to take it over and uh, you just need to control it for a certain amount of time to complete the mission. Or you have these missions here where you have to move this pillar from the beginning of its track to the end of the track, similar to the, uh, the tower mode of Splatoon that I forget what it's called. But instead of standing on it, you have to shoot at it, which is going to distract you from shooting the enemies, which are trying to kill you to stop you from what you're doing. So you gotta try to balance these two different things. We also have the return of the eight balls, which you gotta put in their sockets. Though thankfully, they can't go off the edge here, so they're not as annoying. But I think these are the weakest missions in this mode. They're kind of just like whatever, kind of boring. A lot of them can be over very quickly. Uh, you have a mode where there's a bunch of enemy spawners spread around the arena. You have to go around and destroy all of them, but obviously they're enemy spawners, so they're gonna get in your way of doing that. And I think lastly, there is a mode where you have these enemies that are really, really fast, and you have to hunt down all of them and kill them, and they're gonna try to escape from you as you do it. Uh, but they can get stuck in your ink, so you gotta, like, set up traps for them to get stuck into, uh, and that's pretty fun. So, like I said, you'll be playing all these different modes on these different maps, and things will get varied up as you go. And one thing that's very cool about Side Order is that it has an entirely unique enemy faction, not found anywhere else in the game, similar to Salmon Run. The gelatins here, built specifically for this mode. It works really well here. I like the gelatins, though I can't help but wonder, would it really have been that hard to make some reskins of the existing enemy types? You know, uh, take some Octarians, take some Salmonids, and just turn them into gelatins, you know? Would have added a lot more variety in terms of what you could encounter in this mode, because that is my biggest criticism of Side Order. While this is a roguelike mode that you're meant to play over and over and over many, many times, there's not that much stuff here. There's not, in my opinion, enough to justify the amount of playthroughs that the game wants you to do, because you will be doing the same missions on the same floors against the same enemy types many, 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 many times if you really put your time into side order and try to unlock everything. And you really start to feel like this could use at least double as many everything as what's currently in the game. Like, there's only, I think, like, six bosses in side order, and it's the same one final boss every single time you fight him. The story aspect of side order, when you beat the game, is just beating the final boss for the first time. But then after that, the game encourages you to beat the game with all the different weapon types. And that means doing at least 12 playthroughs of Side Order. And I feel like the game just does not have enough to justify doing all those playthroughs. My recommendation would be not to play Side Order all in one go if you want to get to the end and see, oh, is there an extra ending or a final bonus boss fight? No, there's not. I would recommend playing this game like you would Salmon Run and Multiplayer. Just throw it into your rotation of things you play 
when you load up Splatoon to have some fun. Sometimes you do some matches, sometimes you're like, eh, yeah, I'll do a run of side order. That, I think, is the way that you will most enjoy this mode. And enjoy it, I think you will, especially if you were a fan of the difficulty of Octo Expansion, because side order gets fucking hard. When you first start playing this thing, you're like, holy shit, these challenges are unreasonably difficult. Oh my god, dude. There are just so many fucking enemies coming at you all the goddamn time. It's so insane. It's so chaotic. Look at this shit. I'm supposed to be fucking shooting the pillar to get it to progress. It's like, you think I have fucking time to do that, motherfucker? I'm trying not to get killed by everything. Oh my goodness. It is definitely fun, but of course, this is a roguelike mode, so every time you do a playthrough and every time you die, you get some uh, permanent currency that you can take to Marina to get some permanent upgrades to give yourself a better shot out there. You can reduce the damage you take, increase the damage you do, allow you to carry more stacks of armor, have more lives so you have more attempts before you game over and have to start the tower over. You can increase the amount of in-game currency you get, so you can use shops, you can make it so more shops spawn, you can give yourself discounts at that shop so you can buy more upgrades. You know, it's typical roguelike stuff. As you play, you'll get more and more powerful. And of course, there are the upgrades that you find just throughout the level. Every single time you complete a mission, you will then get the choice of what the next mission you're going to do is. But you're kind of choosing many different things at once. You're choosing the next mission, the upgrade you want, and the difficulty of what that next mission you're going to play is going to be, which will also impact the payoff of how much money you're going to get. So there are all these factors to consider when picking what do you want? What do you want to do? What do you want to play? What do you want to fight? Are you ready to handle that thing? Because, you know, sometimes you'll see, ooh, I really want that upgrade and it'll give me a lot of money, but oof, it's on rigorous difficulty and those rigorous difficulty missions can be fucking brutal, man. So maybe I'll just take the normal difficulty mission or even the hard one that's more manageable. That's not too bad. But then you won't get as good of an upgrade, and you'll have less money for the shops. Ooh, I really want that upgrade, but ooh... Alright, fuck it, we're gonna do it. And then you die, and then you take on that rigorous mission, and you die, and you learn your lesson. And, uh, the upgrades that you get throughout a run are the kinds of things you would expect. You know, upgrades to your stats, increased speed, increased damage, increased ink capacity, uh, reduce how much ink you use. Uh, but also other kinds of, like, cool little effects, like uh, restoring ink by killing enemies or just moving around, decreasing the cooldowns for how long it takes for your special to build up, and lots of, you know, typical things you would expect from a game like this. And it's all about picking those right upgrades that synergize well with what you've already picked up and what works well for your weapon types. But there's also a whole random drop system. Every time you kill an enemy, then uh, there's a chance it might drop something. And as you kill more and more enemies in uh, quick succession, you'll build up what they call the lucky chain, which the higher the chain is, then the higher the chances something is going to drop. And that's another thing you can upgrade. You can increase the size of your lucky chain so it can get bigger and bigger, giving you better chances of drops. You can also just increase the probability of things dropping or make things drop that normally don't drop, like armor and stuff like that. Uh, there's also these disc pieces that you can collect, which if you get all three of them, then it makes this big shockwave, which kills a bunch of enemies and it stops the spawners from spawning more enemies. So it gives you like a breather, gives you a moment to work on your objectives. And uh, this is where we start to run into some of the problems with the system here in side order, because... While side order is very, very difficult, it's only very, very difficult at first. Of course, as you keep playing, you keep getting those permanent upgrades. But as you keep getting those permanent upgrades, you start unlocking more things that can show up in the random rotation. And with enough of those upgrades, you become an unstoppable killing machine. Particularly the things I'm talking about are the random drops, lucky chains, and the Pearl drone. So Pearl is a little robot drone following you around in this mode, because reasons. And uh, she can help you out in the fight. You can give her some abilities that she will do on cooldowns. You can see those meters on the right side of the screen. Every time it fills up, then she's going to do something. So she could shoot an enemy with ink, or she can shoot a splat bomb, or a killer whale, or even shoot out a whole ink strike uh, and do a big ton of damage to an area. And, you know, she'll just passively, automatically target enemies and do stuff whenever it's available and off cooldown. And if you level up Pearl with the permanent upgrades and then you get a bunch of her abilities during your run, 
she is a weapon of mass destruction. She will just annihilate everything because she can equip up to five weapons at a time. And then there are also upgrades where inking turf will fill up her meters, killing enemies will fill up her meters. There are random drops that can fill up her meters that you can add to the lucky chain. And she'll just go on an onslaught. And she'll just kill fucking everything for you. You don't even have to do anything. Literally. You can just stand there and Pearl will just kill everything because her meters just start feeding into themselves. She shoots out bombs and ink strikes and mines and she's killing all these enemies, which is filling her meters back up so she can just keep on doing it over and over and over. And all the time she's killing all these enemies, she's bringing the lucky chain up to its maximum value almost immediately, meaning you're getting tons of random drops. So you got tons of armor, tons of those discs that freeze all the enemies. And it just becomes a breeze at that point. You feel like you're barely even doing anything. It feels like Pearl is the one playing the game, and you're the one that's assisting on the sidelines, helping out a little bit. You just shoot and kill a couple enemies here and there, and then the moment those meters fill, it's Pearl time, baby, and she will kill everything for you. And, uh, it was not long before this game became a cakewalk for me, and I beat all 12 runs in the game with all the different weapon types in a row without a single failure between them, and the only ones that were difficult was the first one and the last one. And this is probably what's most responsible for side order starting to feel a bit long in the tooth to me, because at a certain point it's like, this is no longer a challenge, this is no longer a will I be able to beat this run, it's uh, it's only a matter of time, literally. I don't even have to try and I will definitely beat this run, which makes it kind of feel like a waste of time. And the fact that I had to do everything 12 times, it really felt superfluous because the different weapons I was using didn't even make that much of an impact because Pearl and random drops that gave me my special every two seconds is what was really killing everything. However, to be fair, the game does have a balancing mechanic for this, if you're up for it. Uh, there's an upgrade you can get which multiplies the amount of permanent currency for upgrades and cosmetics you can use to buy after a run, but the multiplier increases based on how many of your upgrades you don't have equipped. So it encourages you to try to beat the game with as few upgrades as possible. However, I still found it relatively easy to work the system in a way where I had not too many upgrades on so I would get a decent multiplier to my endgame bonus, but I still had plenty of firepower that would kill everything for me. Unless you really want to go for the full challenge and go for that triple payout and not equip any of the upgrades, uh, which I have not attempted, and maybe I should, because that would probably be hard as fuck, and that might be pretty fun. Uh, so that's pretty much side order, and like I said, I think it's very good, very fun, but it does get too easy eventually, and it goes on for too long, especially in regards to how easy it becomes. But it's still very much a good time, and even if you're not super into roguelikes, you don't plan on doing a million playthroughs of it, it's still just a good, fun single-player mode if you just want to beat it that first time. It took me about three hours to get my first win here, and that's pretty much all of the main story stuff. There's like a couple extra things you can unlock if you play more, but it's not really worth it. As far as the story of Side Order is concerned, I'm not going to go too into it, because honestly, it's not really that substantial. Basically, this is a virtual simulation that Marina put together, and an AI entity took control of it, and it started to use it to try to create the perfect world of order, building off of the final Splatfest of Splatoon 2, which was Chaos and Order. Order lost, and so now Order has come back with a vengeance, and that's a really cool thing. They did the same thing with uh, Splatoon 2 story mode between Callie and Marie. Callie lost, she became kind of the villain of Splatoon 2. So I hope that trend continues. Keep your eyes out for the final Splatfest of Splatoon 3, whatever that's gonna be. Uh, but anyway, this being a roguelike mode, there's not a lot of story content here. It's primarily focused on gameplay and replayability, so they keep that stuff to a minimum. You still get uh, some uh, journal entries from Marina that you can unlock with some extra little bits, but it's mostly just the development process of her making this, and it's not that interesting. There's not a whole lot of character development here. Uh, though I will say, the finale of Side Order, pretty friggin' good. When you beat the final boss for the first time, it triggers a big story sequence, final ending boss fight, uh, and this has that typical Splatoon big epic final finale, big crazy music going on, and it's very cool 
Uh, things come together here pretty well. It's got epic music going on. And then you basically have like a victory lap final boss fight where you get all of the upgrades available all at once. You become this insanely super overpowered character as you wail on the final boss. And then there's a big laser working together with Pearl and everything. And it's like, this is what I'm talking about. This is how you do one of these goddamn Splatoon finales. This is good stuff. Although maybe that's just my own bias, because I much more like Pearl and Marina than the other characters from Splatoon 3's main single player. But damn it, it doesn't change the fact that I really like the finale here, and I would say I kind of preferred it to the main campaign's uh, finale, though still not as good as Octo Expansion. Nothing will ever be as good as Octo Expansion. Though I do want to say, after playing Octo Expansion and then Splatoon 3 and then Side Order back to back to back, I feel like having all these big epic finales every single time at the ending of a Splatoon single player, it kind of cheapens it a little bit. You know it's going to be there. You know they're going to do some big cool thing and they're going to play the music and you're going to get all hype. And that kind of diminishes it a little bit. I think maybe we could do with some Splatoon single players that are a little bit more mellow for a bit. So that way, when they bring back the big epic finale, you'd be like, oh shit, they're doing it again, and catch you off guard and be surprising, and that would excite you. Uh, I guess we'll see. We'll see what the future of Splatoon holds, because honestly, I feel like at this point, Splatoon 3 is everything you could ever want from Splatoon, right? It's got the single player that has a lot of the best bits of all the previous single players. The multiplayer is the biggest and bestest it's ever been. Salmon Run also has a bunch of extra stuff in this game that makes it super cool. Now you have a fun little replayable single player mode. There's so many different ways to play Splatoon, all of them being really fun. And they've refined the core Splatoon gameplay so well and added so much to it at this point that... To me, it feels like we're good. It feels like this is the peak of Splatoon. I don't know what more you could do beyond just even more things, but is that really necessary? I feel like Splatoon has hit the point it needs to hit. This feels like its final form, and anything more would be nice, certainly, but it's not really gonna blow your socks off, not really gonna blow you away, not really gonna fundamentally change what Splatoon is. Unless, uh, for the future of the series, they take things in a very different direction, maybe change up the gameplay in some significant way. Maybe now it is time to start fresh and rebuild Splatoon from the ground up and try some new things with it? Who knows? I guess we'll see. Honestly, after how great these games are, I would love to see the team at Nintendo behind Splatoon do something else. Like, they've done plenty of Splatoon. Let them, uh, let them invent something new now. I want to see what else this team is capable of, because considering how well they landed Nintendo's first ever multiplayer shooter, I feel like if you give these guys any assignment, they're going to ace whatever it is, because clearly they know what the fuck they're doing. Whatever is next for Splatoon or next for the team behind Splatoon, I am definitely going to be there for it. This team has earned my full confidence in basically whatever they're going to make, I'm probably going to buy. And that is a privilege I allot to very few developers. And if that doesn't say how much I like Splatoon, I don't know what else will.